Now, why this picture? I want to introduce you, those of you who were born in the 1990s, to a man that perhaps you might not know, but everybody else knows him as Bob Marley. And I love that man behind me. I love him. In fact, it is my one single regret that I was not born before 1980, because maybe I might have got a chance to meet him. And I love him because his songs are so powerful. Not just because they are powerful, but they spoke for the first time about us, us black people, right? In fact, his songs were so powerful that a lot of people would refer to them as a poor man's newspaper. Poor people who didn't have access to the news got to learn about what really was going on from Mr. Bob Marley himself. And it's really poignant that I'm reflecting on Bob Marley today, 37 years after Zimbabwe's independence. No guesses why, right? In 1980, again, for the people who were born after the, after the 1990s, in 1980, during the independent celebrations of Zimbabwe, Bob Marley got on stage and sang a song that is now famous, titled Zimbabwe. Who remembers that first line? Every man has a right to decide his own destiny. You guys remember that, that line, eh? it's, it's a classic line. And the reason why this line is so important, I shall get into, right? But 37 years later, we're reflecting again on Zimbabwe's journey and with an elegance very rare on this continent. They have just handled a bloodless coup and a transfer of power from a person who was there when Bob Marley first sang this song to the person who's there today. History will judge his actions in coming days. But you know, in the 1980s, there was no social media, right? And today there is. And elegant as Zimbabwe's journey is today, there's also a lot of humor going around on social media. Does anybody remember this tweet? And the story won't even be about Zimbabwe. Well, a 93-year-old Mugabe, played by Forrest Whitaker, is being deposed by the army. The real story will be about a journalist Kate Winslet, flying in from London to cover the coup and falling in love with guide and ex-Rhodesian ex badass Leonardo DiCaprio. Now, I found this hilarious, but even more was this, right? A little better. <laughs> Don Chido as Mugabe, Halle Berry, Will Smith, you know. And I think there was another one saying how, and all of the people, irrespective of the fact that there are very many languages in Zimbabwe, will be speaking in Swahili, <laughs> Mugabe included. So much as there is elegance in Zimbabwe's story, this humor has caused me to ask some questions about why, why exactly are people tweeting about Kate Winslet and Leonardo DiCaprio at this time? It's because storytelling, storytelling is technical, right? but they're asking themselves a fundamental question that Bob Marley asked in that line about destiny, about identity. What is the storied history of Zimbabwe going to be when we look back on this moment? What is their identity going to be about? And that's very interesting to reflect on that question and, look, and step back and look at it from that point of view. Because I'm a journalist, and journalism, like songs, even like tweets, is about storytelling. Now, journalism is also technical. The mores of the profession dictate that we go by three things, or do three things, aspire to do three things, inform, educate, and entertain. Now, here's a quick question to the crowd. How many of you think that Kenyan journalism today is doing that well? You can raise your hands. I'll wait. That's exactly the amount of people who I thought would raise their hands. And you know what, even as I am a journalist, I agree with you. Journalism today is not doing the job that it's supposed to be doing, right? And I'll take just one example from our news bulletins. Today in the news, politician X said this about politician Y, and we have political analysts from X camp and Y camp to analyze why politician X said this about politician Y. We put them together, and somewhere in the middle is an objective story. But where's the truth? Is the truth there? I don't think so. 
In our news bulletins, we consistently see this race to the bottom of false equivocation, putting one politician or one character up against another, and somewhere in the middle there should be some truth, but no true introspection, no true investigation to what actually is the truth. And that's a race to the bottom because literally, as we get lower and lower and lower in the news bulletin after business somewhere, especially on the weekends, we slide in somehow very elegantly into gossip. When did gossip become a part of the news? I ask myself every day. Now, why is this important? I, I go back to the tenets of journalism, inform, educate, entertain. But more than that, the philosophical role that I spoke about. Journalism is technical. Every day we tell stories, every day. But what are we doing every day? We're taking one block and putting it on top of another, on top of another, and putting a roof on top, and building an architecture, our identity. And this is especially important as Africans to reflect on. Because before 1884, there might as well have not been any Africa. If you read our history books, the curriculum that our children are learning before 1884. And here's two examples from my own life of historical happenings that informed me that will serve to demonstrate this point. The man on the screen is a man called William Henry Shepard, an American. At the turn of the century, at the turn of the 19th to 20th century, in fact, in January 1900, the New York Times ran a series of articles about what was then the Congo Free State. Previously, it had been thought that King Leopold, the Belgian king who had been given that as his protectorate, was doing a really good job, somehow getting ivory and all these sorts of things, while in fact it was written into the agreements that he made, making sure that the Africans are well catered for and cared for. But what did the, what did the New York Times write about? It wrote about children and young women whose hands were cut off at the wrist, in their hundreds, because they weren't delivering their daily rations of rubber to the companies that were serving King Leopold. It talked about entire villages of the Bakuba being decimated without a care by a militia that was known as a force publique, mercenaries who were gathered from tribes, tribal warriors, and different places to come and work for the companies that were serving the Belgian elite. It talked about that. And for the first time, I sat down after reading this. It was done in a book called King's, King Leopold's Ghost, which I, I recommend. After reading this, I felt a sense of anger and injustice. Why are they doing this to us? What did we ever do to deserve that kind of treatment way back then? For what reason? I was upset, incensed. And I felt a sense of injustice that propelled me into journalism as well. But what I didn't know was that that story that had informed an identity for myself was also informing a storied history and identity for Africans, one of victimhood, one of sorrow, one of loss, one of an inability to change our circumstances because someone else was in charge. But then last year, I watched a fascinating series by a Harvard professor called Henry Louis Gates, Jr. It's called Africa's Ancient Civilizations. I'd recommend that you watch it. And perhaps not for the first time, but in great detail, I got to learn about Africa's true history, about civilizations in Benin that had wide boulevards, wider than you see in Paris, lit by lamps, way back in the 15th, uh, 15th century, about them having ornate art that was so good that a person who discovered it later on thought, and in fact posited in a book, that it might have been either some civilizations from the West that came there and conquered the civilization and gave them that art, or aliens. It couldn't have been us, right? I learned about the king of the Bakongo, who had an emissary to the Pope in the 15th century. Great civilizations. And of course, the great one that a lot of people know about, Mensa Musa, 
the richest man in living history who because of his riches while he was on his way to to a pilgrimage to the mecca because he'd give out so much gold it threw the prices of gold worldwide the gold market became, went into a tailspin gold prices crashed because of how much gold he was giving out on his way to mecca that's a history that i didn't know that's an identity that wasn't part of my story and what it did for me is what it made me stand up taller it made me walk taller and not look at my situation and my my own history and my own destiny as one that's informed by a sense of injustice because you know what injustice does or be, or feeling like you're constantly under threat even if you're fighting you're fighting from a place of disadvantage now how does that inform journalism or my journalism my colleagues and i started a, a company called africa uncensored our role and our goal is to show africa as it really is the good the bad the ugly everything our editorial policy is the truth now that sounds like an extremely high moral objective but i don't see why we should shy away from doing that because for so long parts of the truth were hidden from us and what would the truth do to build an identity for an african tomorrow that's us but i'm not the only one there's ama bungane in south africa anybody who's read about the guptas will likely know that ama bungane an organization just like ours by set up by investigative journalists who are angry enough to do this were the ones who were responsible for the gupta leaks in nigeria there's premium times in ghana there's anas aremayo anas he who exposed 22 judges for corruption not didn't just expose them and write about them he caught them on camera now there's examples of this in botswana in different parts of the of the continent of journalists who are trying to do this and story by story build an identity through investigative journalism mind you that's based on truth one that will build an identity for tomorrow that really is a reflection of what's going on today it doesn't always have to be positive by the way it's positive and it's negative because that's what human beings are binary now the reason that i say that good journalism must be paid for is because our organization amabongane anas and all of the people across africa are competing with the same same race to the bottom you know the same politician a versus politician b with some gossip thrown in the middle that competition and i'm not complaining i just want people to reflect on that because if you're not deliberate about the stories that you allow to be told today what does it do to your identity tomorrow and i posit to you that the journalism that i am speaking of should be paid for the journalism by the amabonganes of this world because it there must be a premium for people to be able to get the facts and the truth that they need much as it is a social good now i've just looked at it through the lens of investigative reporting and it might be a, a bit self-serving for me to stand here and talk about that because i'm a beneficiary of it but wait there's more there's a few other organizations that i want you to think about who are so important in the crafting of an identity that have been forgotten another question how many of you here and you can raise your hands watched when was the last time you watched anything on kbc if it's within the last week or month you can put up your hand 1 2 3 out of a crowd of about 100 right kbc kenya broadcasting corporation if you're not kenyan maybe tanzanian it's tbc south africa it's sabc and the other bc 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 is all over the continent our public broadcasters have been bastardized because of interference by our political elite mostly where the first five stories are today the president went and cut a ribbon somewhere after that he turned around and spoke to his deputy and then he turned around once again and then he went this way and had lunch and after the break the exciting afternoon of guess who our president <laughs> that's what has become the storied history of public broadcasters and yet the public broadcaster that's just an example in the news by the way but the public broadcaster's role is really essentially it's to deal with our identity 
the public broadcaster in your country does that on a daily basis through programming, through news, through culture, through speaking about communities that you didn't know about, through threading through the different differences that we have and speaking truthfully, honestly, and neutrally about what it is our countries are today, what they will be tomorrow. And yet in 1997, Kenya Broadcasting Corporation lost millions, in fact, billions of shillings, about half a billion shillings, when the licenses for televisions that, we, that they benefited from was scrapped. Now, because of mismanagement, because of that political interference, it is now sliding further and further and further into debt. And yet, it is the one institution charged with communicating on a daily basis the story of our identity. So what's your role in all of this, I'm, one, I'm, I'm thinking you're asking. Your role as a citizen is aside from looking for the nuggets in good journalism that I spoke about earlier to support your public broadcaster by demanding that your legislators fund, funnel funds into those public broadcasters, by demanding that the best possible content about your country gets onto the public broadcaster because it deals with the storytelling, the everyday storytelling that will tomorrow build your identity. So do you want an identity that is hunched over and burdened by the sins of today? Or do you want an identity that can straighten its back and walk tall into the future because the stories that were told today, the building blocks that we did today, that we cemented today, have built a tomorrow that you can be proud of and your children can be proud of? I end again with Bob Marley. And Bob Marley, again, like I said, was an inspirational figure. He is an inspiration to me. And he said one thing that I think goes to the role that I'm speaking of, the role that I'm, or the challenge that I'm throwing to you. When you live for yourself, you live in vain. When you live for others, you live again. That is the architecture that identity speaks to. The technical things that we do today as journalists inform what we are tomorrow and they must be about other people. And your role as a citizen, as a person who sits and watches, is to stand up and live for others by demanding the best out of your public broadcaster and looking for the best possible journalism and supporting it. Thank you.